I had the privilege of a lifetime. 12 years ago, I had just graduated from seminary. My wife and I had been married for about six years, and we had two little boys. Living in Denver, Colorado, at the time, we began to ask God where he would call us to be church planters. And I'll never forget the first time that God spoke Utah into my heart. My first response was, get behind me, Satan. Uh, I don't want to go to Utah. I don't know where Utah is at. I didn't even know if it was a part of the United States of America at that point. The only thing I knew about Utah is probably the one thing you know about Utah. Utah is where Mormons live. We began to do research because uh, how many of you men, especially know in here that when the Holy Spirit can't get your attention, he speaks to your wife? And then you can't ignore him anymore. <laughs> and uh, man, my wife came to me soon after that and said, what about Utah? If God has really called us to plant a church for people that don't do church, look at these statistics. Did you know that the Christian church in Utah, and when we talk about Christians in Utah, we talk about all of us. Uh, because we need all of us. So from the Catholic church all the way through to the other spectrum of of Christianity, the church in Utah represents only 2% of our state. Our state is over 75% Mormon uh, that have bought into a works-based religious system that is only letting people down because how many of you know we're not good enough? It's why we needed a savior. And then there's about 25% of our community uh, that is completely unchurched, that has been presented an idea of who God is and how God loves so discriminately that they've said, that is not a God for me. And so we signed up to move into Utah 10 years ago. We had the privilege of planting a church called the Genesis Project. And our hope was to be a people who ushered in new beginnings, which is what that word Genesis means, into our community. And man, God has been so good to us. Actually, the first two years that, uh, that we were church planners in our community, we didn't see a whole lot of growth. We didn't see a whole lot of movement. The one thing we recognized is that God had called us to a very hard place, uh, hard ground to break. And I'll never forget the first time that uh, I went out to buy a house. I told my wife, honey, we've got to stop being renters in Utah or it's going to get so hard one day, you're going to find me in the middle of the night throwing our stuff in a U-Haul trailer and we're going to be somewhere else. And Uh, I was sitting down at a table at a local Wendy's restaurant. How many know if God can move in Wendy's, he can move anywhere, right? And I was sitting with a real estate agent that I had found in the yellow pages. Remember when we used to have those things made out of paper uh, that sat around here? We don't have those anymore. But uh, I sat across this table from a real estate agent. We had looked at a few houses that day, but he asked me, uh, what brought you to Utah and what's your story? And I would told my story many times before. And to be honest with you, most Mormon people uh, just have a really hard time wrapping their mind around church planting and and what that entails. And so I began to tell our story. And in the middle of that uh, story, I look up and I see a man sitting across from me who is absolutely weeping. And and, and not just tears in his eyes, but like ugly cry. (laughs) And he looks at me and he says, man, I, I, I don't know why we're sitting down here today. But he told me his story that Uh, Just six months prior to us sitting down, he had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, 32 cancerous tumors down his brain and his spine. He was an atheist, believed that God didn't exist. But as he prepared for death, writing his obituary with his wife, moving back to their hometown in Ogden, Utah, to prepare for his death, over the course of one week, he had two brain scans. At the beginning of that week, they told him, yeah, it's terminal. Those 32 cancerous tumors uh, not only are not shrinking, but they're growing. Seven days later, he went back to the exact same hospital. They scanned his brain once, then they scanned his brain twice. Then for a third time, he started to get a little bit perturbed, saying, what's going on? They said, we don't know what's going on with our machine. Finally, the doctor came in. He had been there for six hours, and he said, sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but your cancer is gone. We can still see the voids in in your brain matter where those tumors used to be, but there is no sign of cancer in your body. And Kyle looked at him and he said, man, I, I need you to help this make sense to me. And the doctor said, all I can tell you is in the medical world, we call this spontaneous remission. This atheist man went back home. He Googled spontaneous remission and the only word he could find was miracle. And so you have an atheist who had an encounter with a God who heals. Two days later, he gets a call from a pastor who felt the need to have to buy a home so he didn't leave the mission field that God had called him to. 
So that day, Kyle looked at me. He said, man, we want to be a part of this church. And then I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. I said, well, this is a vision, which means it doesn't exist, brother. Like, there's not really a place for you to come. He said, that's cool. We want to be a part. I went home that day, and I told my wife after two years, I said, honey, you won't believe it. We just doubled the size of our church today. (laughs) We went from two to four. God is moving. We are in the middle of a revival. So we invited uh, Kyle and his wife, Holly, to come and to begin meeting with us in our living room. And we saw that small group grow. Today, Kyle is actually the executive pastor of our church at the Genesis Project in Ogden. And it seemed like from that moment forward, uh, we began to believe in the power of the gospel in our community. And uh, over the years, we've seen uh, our church grow from 100 to 200, 200 to 400, 400 to 800 people. Today, uh, we are a community in Ogden, Utah of about 1,500 people. About 90% of those people made a first-time decision to follow Jesus inside of our church, which is awesome uh, because they don't know any better. (laughs) Uh, They don't don't know that there's better preachers out there than me. They don't know uh, how messed up some of our ministries are because we're all they've ever known. We just tell them it's normal. Don't go visit a church in Texas or it's going to mess everything up for us in Utah. Uh, And uh, over the course of the last four years, uh, we've uh, decided to become a movement that uh, very simply, even at times that it doesn't make sense, pastors, you shared to say yes to what God was calling us to do. And uh, we've had the privilege of planning a church just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, in a really hard place to reach unchurched people. Um, A few years ago, we were approached with the opportunity to purchase a strip club in Fort Collins, Colorado. That is a really, really long story that I don't have time to share with you. Uh, But uh, to make a long story short, we have seen 12 of those former dancers give their life to Jesus Christ, baptized in the very same building they used to take their clothes off for money. Genesis Project in Fort Collins, Colorado today is a thriving community that is committed to reaching the darkest, hardest places of their community. Uh, We planted a church in Provo, Utah, Uh, which you might not have heard of before, but maybe you've heard of Brigham Young University. It's located in Provo. Provo actually represents the largest religious majority in the United States of America, 97.5% Mormon. The Christian church doesn't even show up on the census radar in this community. And we were able to plant a church for people who don't do church. Actually, the mayor of Provo called me up and he said, hey, can, can we get together and talk? I said, yeah, I would love to. He said, man, I want you to know that your reputation in Ogden precedes you. And, and we're so grateful for a church that reaches the attics. We're so grateful for a church that goes to the hard and dark places. We're so grateful for a church like yours in Ogden. But let me make myself clear. We do not need a Genesis project in Provo. And I said, well, I, I'll have to agree to disagree with you, sir. And uh, just our second year, this past Easter, we saw over 250 people show up to a church in a community that were looking for something different. And that wasn't our music, that wasn't our preaching, that wasn't our facility, but it was a gospel of unconditional love, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus. Uh, Just this year, we had the privilege of uh, planting a church out of a 120-year-old United Brethren building in downtown Portland, Oregon, which is widely considered one of the most unchurched places in our country. And today, uh, it is exciting for us to see Genesis Project Portland up and running and reaching their community. And all of this uh, growth for us has really been stemmed by one thing. We often say, Uh, If we were to sit down and write a book on church planning, the title of that book would probably be 99 Things of What Not to Do When Planning a Church, because we have made all those mistakes. But in the 99 things that we've done wrong, uh, we've got one thing right, and that's this, that the gospel still works in our world, that Jesus is just as compelling today as he was 2,000 years ago, that his love, his grace, his mercy, and his invitation into a relationship of discipleship and growth still draws the multitudes in our world. And uh, over the course of the last few years, man, we have had the privilege along with one of our campus pastors, uh, myself and our campus pastor, Rob Coles, to write a book with Thomas Nelson. And uh, I want to give you guys, we have these out front if you didn't get a chance to grab one. It's called The God of New Beginnings which tells the story of the Genesis Project and really lays out a framework of what it means to be an embedded missional church in the hardest places of our community. And uh, interesting story, actually, Rob is uh, the lead pastor of Genesis Project in Fort Collins. He pastors a building that used to be a strip club in in northern Colorado. And uh, 
Rob was actually my youth pastor when I was a young man. Uh, and at 19 years old, uh, for the first time in my life, I made a, a public decision to follow Jesus. And Rob was an integral part of, of that decision for me. And uh, as I went to Bible college and then to seminary, uh, Rob planted a church that he pastored in northern Colorado that had grown uh, to a membership of over 10,000 people in his community, which that is a big church, especially in the western United States. And uh, he was a big part in us connecting with a former strip club owner who had given his life wholeheartedly to Jesus and wanted to see his story, his family's history, redeemed through the gospel of Jesus. And uh, so as we walk through the process, and what's funny is, is, is the strip club owner first went to Rob and to this big mega church that he was leading at the time. Rob got excited about purchasing that strip club, but his board told him, told him no. Uh, said, we just don't want to take on whatever publicity comes along with that type of purchase and acquisition. And so when Rob hit a dead end road, he said to this former strip club owner, uh, he said, man, I don't know if we can do this, but I, I, I know a church and a pastor in Utah that just might be dumb enough to, uh, and that was us. And uh, through the course of that process, Rob walked with us every step of the way. And when we sat down at the table to close on that property, uh, Rob had tears streaming down his face. And he said, bro, uh, I signed up 30 years ago. Rob was 50 years old at the time that we were closing on this building. He said, 30 years ago, I signed up to be a fisher of men. And he said, but I've become the keeper of an aquarium. He said, I don't know the last time that uh, it was the lost and hurting souls of my community that kept me up at night. He said, usually what keeps me up at night is that we have a six and a half million dollar a month budget that we have to meet just to keep our church afloat. And he said, so if you would have me, I want to put my name in the hat to lead this campus. And I said, well, I'll think about it. No, I didn't say that. I, uh, we've been able to write a story, so Rob and I working together, of, of what it means to transition in our life from being keepers of aquariums to fulfilling the mission and the calling of Jesus to being fisher of men.